Hello, everybody, and welcome to those who are joining us um, and watching on the recording. We're going to start in about 30 seconds to a minute, just while we allow people who are um, tuning in live to the session to join us. So for those just joining us, welcome. Uh, we're going to be starting in, a, in about a minute or so. Just wait for some other people to join us for the live session and then we'll get going. Okay, so we're going to start uh, with the webinar now. So hello and welcome everybody to this webinar on the wrist and hand focus shockwave case study presented by John Ostrovskis. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Now this webinar is going to be split up into two sections. We're going to have a 20 minute presentation from John followed by an interactive Q&A session and also a reveal on our competition winner as well. Bit of housekeeping to start us off with. This session is being recorded, um, which you will get access to after this. So if you do miss anything or like to watch anything back, you'll get the recording. You can watch it that all that back for you. Uh, and any questions that you might have, there's a Q and A function that you can find at the bottom of the screen. Please pop questions in there, and we'll get them answered at the end of the session. For anybody who is watching on the recording, if you do have any questions email them into info at physiquip.com and we will get them answered for you. So quick introductions. My name is Dominic Smith. I'm the Clinical Application Specialist at Physiquip. For those of you who don't know Physiquip, we are a medical technology distribution company who work with partners all around the world to bring some of the uh, most, advanced um, most advanced technologies into the UK, one of which being focused shockwave. So with those introductions, I would like to introduce John, uh, who's a physiotherapist and owner of the 919 Clinic in Sheffield. Now, this is our second session with John, so I'm really excited for this, this session uh, following the really good feedback from the first one. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to John and you can kick off your presentation. Great. Thanks for that, Dominic. Um, I'm excited about today's presentation because the two cases that I'm um, presenting a largely original work, i.e. they are not as yet seen as being indications for shockwave therapy in the literature. So if we go to the first one, it should be no surprise that those who are at risk of collateral ligament damage to the radial and ulnar collateral ligaments to the interphalangeal joints are rock climbers. And you can imagine the amount of stress that are being placed through these IP joints in this crimp grip. And really the challenge is when these patients are injured, when they come to you, the challenge is to help the injured climber return to as full as function as possible, as quickly as possible. Now, one of my favorite climbing injury books uh, is this one here. And that's not just because I get a mention in it on page 205 as a uh, contributor. It was published in 2015 which really isn't all that long ago, and Focus Shockwave is not mentioned at all in it. Back then, I had not as yet appreciated its usefulness in accelerating healing. And for this particular type of thing, on, on the display in many therapy areas. So when a performance climber is injured, this is the sort of level they need to get back to in training. Tom Randall here, who is not our case though, unfortunately, is known worldwide as an excellent track climber. And this clip of him will help you understand the motion of injury of our case, you mean this left sided middle finger on the collateral ligament of his CIP when he was track climbing, when his head and ring finger was brought to the track during a fall. John, hi, sorry to. John, sorry to interrupt. I think um, for me, it was just kind of going up and down. So if I don't know if that was for, say, the case of anybody else, could you just repeat what you went through then, just on the on the case, please? Just the, the volume was just in and out then. Okay, from Tom Randall, or from before that, this, this, this clip here will help you understand the mode of injury of our case. And our case, the injury is left, PIP 
joint on the middle finger, ulnar collateral ligament, when his ring and middle finger were caught in a crack during the fall. Is that okay now? And so you can imagine the stress that would be placed through your fingers if you fell here. And when things don't go to plan, I saw a case like this yesterday where there was fracture, mangled hands, and in extreme cases, this is actually incredibly rare, fortunately. Are, you, are we okay sound-wise there? Is that okay sound-wise? Okay. So pre-injury, our patient, again, it's, it's not Tom Randall, that fellow, our patient was climbing to a level of 7B. And that's really equivalent to, in running terms, to a sub 18 minute park runner, i.e. he is a high level performer. He was training climbing six times a week. And he was a patient three months ago in January 2020, he was climbing to 6A only twice a week. And with that, that's probably an equivalent to a 24 minute park runner, so it's a lot less intense. He injured his hand in August 2019 when he was away living in France and was climbing November 2019 on return to the UK. He attended a walking clinic. He was referred to a hand consultant who we saw within a few days. He was x-rayed, no abnormality detected. He was referred for hand physio and occupational therapy, which started in November. Two months later in the January, that's 13 months ago, he came to see me saying he was not able to progress his training. On assessment, initially the range of movement of flexion of the IP joints measured with the MCP extended was, was limited. It was tended to palpate on the radial and ulnar collateral ligaments of the PIP with the UCL being much more sensitive than the RCL. Radial deviation of the finger reproduced the ulnar sided pain and if there was a lax end feel. Also on manual muscle tests, the intrinsics between three and four were incredible. There was lots of pain inhibition and I test these with the MCPs in 90 degrees and the MCPs at zero degrees. Also finger flexion was inhibited by pain and I test in this position here with the third finger and also in this position with the MCP at 90 degrees. So was, there was pain on palpation, there was instability, there was weakness. I also performed functional tests for climbers and I used what's called a Tindec device, which I'll describe on the next slide. Um, his mono pull was down 40% capacity and his pinch grip was down 40% capacity. Subjectively, the patient was estimating that his hand was 80% down as far as climbing function goes. If we go to the ultrasound scan of this finger taken day one, this is the ulnar collateral ligament. So you see that it's hypertrophic, there's some instability gapping, a bit of a small shunt component. And that's all consistent with the soft end feel that I was describing with that radial deviation. The same joint opposite side radial collateral ligament, some hypertrophy, but there is actually a little bit of stability there, which you can see, it's not as unstable as the opposite side. And his expectations, he wants to be able to climb like Tom Randall on page one. And he aspires to grade 8A. And grade 8A is a milestone for the elite climber. So just to mention on functional testing, and I find it really useful trying to make the testing meaningful to the patient. The Tindec device sends force information to an app. In this case, we're testing what's called peak load. And we start the test using a mono, which we did with the patient. So pulling, you can see we've got a nice objective measure there. A patient at initial consultation was 40% down on the injured finger. And we can do a pinch test using medium pocket to medium pocket there. And we can pull, and that's a record there that we can keep to compare to future treatments. He was 40% down on that. At his last consultation, he was measuring 80% full capacity compared to the opposite side. The other tests we perform at times are fingerboard functional tests. The full pull-up doesn't really give us much information specifically for fingers. We go to finger specific tests. So we can just form pull-ups like so. And there's a number of variety of other types of hold depending on the presentation of the patient. 
A word of warning, never do that without warming up, as I did there. So getting on to treatment now, pre-treatment, a simple photo as it is a great adjunct to assessment, the physical assessment. And you can see that that's quite swollen there, and that's before we started. In a moment, I'm going to list the specific doses that were applied, but here's an overview of four treatments working to a level, a comfort level of five to seven out of 10. Oops. My usual treatment position for treating fingers is having the patient stable on a plinth, hand on the pillow, well, well supported. To treat the UCL of the middle finger, I apply the hand piece to the finger on this sort of angle from the dorsal aspect. And treatment one, we applied 2000 pulses in this position for the UCL. We also treated the radial collateral ligament for 1500 pulses as well. At, when he turned up for the second treatment, the radial collateral ligament was no longer sensitive. So we applied treatment to the dorsal aspect and then to the volar aspect of the UCL of the same finger. Third and fourth treatment, we went from dorsal only in this position here. So after four treatments, and that's five weeks on, this photo reassessment, that's convincing just on its own. You can see the massive change in that. Now, there, overall, there were four treatments. And if you look at these, that's one week apart, that's two weeks, that's two weeks. Look at the power, we'll be using maximum power, and that's quite rare for any condition. But sometimes we reach those in fingers when we're treating them a few months after injury. If you're treating these within the first couple of weeks of injury, which I sometimes do, often we'll be starting at one out of 20 or even less than that. So, application is pretty much as I was describing in that video earlier. And prior to attending for the second treatment, his radial collateral ligament was no longer sensitive to touch and the manual muscle tests were mostly improved. Prior to treatment number three, the range of movement in that flexion, that was much improved. The manual muscle tests were all improved and he'd made a jump in his climbing. He was now climbing to 6C, which is much harder than the 6A he started off originally. Um, and prior to the last treatment, on that Tindec hand measuring device for the uh, climbing holes, the mono pull was now measuring 80% function and the pinch was me measuring 80%, which is a big improvement. As subjectively, he said his hand was feeling tighter, there was decreased apprehension, and he was able to tolerate torsion whilst he was climbing actually on rock. So in preparation for today's presentation, 12 months on, I sent this patient an email requesting a condition report, asking him what he thought to the treatment that he had uh, and what he recommended. Um, this is what he replied. So he was actually quite happy. As you can see here, is 90% back to full use. He can put some lateral loading through it. He keeps it taped whilst climbing. So it means that he still has some apprehension. So he's not feeling 100% confident, but he's climbing at a higher level than pre-injury. And to me, this is significant as previously, my experience was that this type of patient was making very little or no progress. So I think it's a very, very positive response. So in summary, for this type of injury of the collateral ligaments to the interphalangeal joints, previously I was seeing it as a career of sports limiting injury. Prior to using focus, I was using radial shockwave, but radial is really uncomfortable. It does work, uh, but patients, I found that patients just were not returning for it. Focus shockwave up to four treatments would really shift these problems on. And I have treated these patients up to seven or at once one patient up to eight times with um, really good effect. And it's always good to have a model, uh, a guideline to help get you started. Move on from guidelines as soon as you've got your feet and, and understand what you're doing there. So make sure you pay, make sure the pain, the pain is tolerable. Increase your um, power slowly. 
work you can work from both the dorsal and volar surface, see which one, which see which angles tend to insinate and reproduce more discomfort. And so to me, this approach is really it's oven ready, ready to go. So get treating these is what I would say. I would say it's quite safe for anyone to get stuck into these. Current literature, I haven't seen anything in any journals. As far as social media goes, I did make a video about 18 months ago, and this particular video on this link is a case with an avulsion, which is why today I have presented this case without an avulsion. So now I've presented anecdotal evidence of this injury, both with and without um, an avulsion. So we'll get on to the second case. Are you hearing me okay there, Dominic? That's all okay, I'm good, okay. And so this is our case, and uh, did you guess correctly? Uh, we're just gonna play the video. Oh, that was a, 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 okay, a lot, okay. Just go down that position and tell me when the pain starts, because we're gonna do another two treatments. Just in that position, just waiting there, okay. So right there, but okay. it's, it's when it's most bent back. Okay, uh, but you couldn't have even tried that last week. You're saying after yeah, the first treatment is a lot better. So. Okay, so we'll just stop there. So we're going to review that after two further treatments of Shockwave. So most of you have probably seen these videos, but just for the sake of playback, we'll uh, run the whole thing. This is immediately after treatment three of 3,000 pulses up to 11 out of 20 on the intensity scale. So let's try that again. Go into that prop position, please. And how does that feel? And just press up and tell me how that feels. Just two press ups, one, one more. How does that feel? It feels, it feels fine. This arm one, feels a bit weak on it, but. One, <laughs> one more. And come up. So we'll reassess that next week. And that's only eight days apart. And there's still one further treatment to go. And this patient here, I don't know what uh, you've all guessed. Apparently there's one correct answer in the bag there. It's a uh, dorsal wrist ganglion. And many of you will probably be surprised as you may not have considered this to be a suitable indication for focused shockwave therapy. So going on to his history, is a 25-year-old builder who was bitten by a dog three years previous. He immediately went to A&E. He was treated and discharged. The next morning, it was infected. He returned to A&E when he was hospitalized and was in, in hospital for two weeks on an antibiotic trip. And it took him two months to actually return to work. Functionally, in the previous 12 months, it was a decreased capacity for digging, no capacity for jarring, so jobs like wall breaking were impossible, and he was unsafe on ladders and scaffold. And so if we go to the first ultrasound scan, so this is an approximate carpus, that's scaphoid, that's lunate, that's a great landmark to drop off from, and we're going to go distance very slowly. So you can see as we dropped off distally from that scaphoid lunate margin there, there was a hypoechoic oval non-compressible structure which ended over the capitate. And that's a classic site for a dorsal wrist ganglion and it conforms to the characteristics of a dorsal wrist ganglion as described in this article here, Sonography of Wrist Ganglions, co-authored by John Jacobson. So at the time of the second press-up assessment, eight days later, and this time we're dropping off the distal radius. So there's this is tubicle, that's compartment two, that's ECRB, ECRL, extensive holes as long as there. And you'll see in a moment, unfortunately I can't talk whilst the actual uh, video is on, but you'll see scaphoid there, lunate there, and you'll only see a remnant of the um,
So at that point, there's only just a small residue of that uh, ganglion. And you can see that functional change was quite dramatic. Um, and so this patient had four treatments. The treatments are one week apart. These are the powers that we started with. So we're starting gradually increasing in power to a level of six, seven out of 10 on a pain scale. The pulses starting with 2,500 pulses and going to 3,000. With each treatment, the patient actually said, look, I've had enough. And with the first two treatments, I was stopping about every three to 500 pulses to do a small functional test to see if there was an improvement. And there were small gains at each time to ensure that there was comfort there. And the insulation was into the dorsal wrist in the area of the lunate capitate scaphoid. And you can see that functional improvement there. It's quite dramatic. So again, in preparation for today's presentation, I emailed him to ask him what he thought to his treatment that he'd had four months ago. And this is what he has replied. He has full movement without pain, no, more or less no swelling. And so now I have four similar cases of resolution with no recurrence. But I think the question really stands, well, why did I do it um, where there isn't any journal articles or any literature that support this type of treatment? So if we go into my story of that, so current, current literature, no studies, no journal mentioned. In 2018, I had a different dorsal wrist ganglion case. I referred for an injection to a, thera for, to a therapist with view to aspirate uh, with corticosteroid injection. This is a well-established approach. The injection therapist replied that, look, it's pointless to do that because the ganglions always return and they're difficult to perform. I then referred to another injection therapist who then replied, look, I prefer to wait to see what happens. Now, at that stage, I'd already registered to attend a shockwave conference where the lead presenter was Professor Carsten Knobloch, who is a German plastics and hand surgeon who is widely published and an established researcher on shockwave therapy. And I pre-posted a question asking of his experience, if any, on treating dorsal wrist ganglion with shockwave. So this is him, this is at Royal College of General Practitioners, September 2018. And midway through his presentation, he asked for John from Sheffield to identify himself. He then presented ultrasound before and after slides of successful recent shockwave interventions of dorsal wrist ganglion. He then said this will be included in his soon to be published book. And of course I bought a copy of it and this is part of the page, part of, part of the description of treatment for dorsal wrist ganglion. But as yet, it's, it's published by level 10, uh, so you can purchase that. But there's no mentions of research, there's this description of pathology and this possible treatment. I contacted Carson Knobloch with this exact case that I'm presenting to you today, asking him of his opinion as to the possible mechanisms of potential resolution for this type of case. And he replied, what he suspects is that there's a disruption of this ganglion cyst wall. Pretty much talking about a rupture of the membrane. So one has the viscous nucleic material decompressing out into the surrounding tissues. So my thoughts, I agree that that's likely to be happening, the wall rupture and the decompression of the viscous nucleic material. And that's just a discussion that I would really like to continue with Carsten Knobloch. But no adverse effects were reported in any of my cases, not even temporarily, which I would expect if it was a decompression of the contents only. So my question is, yeah. does the insulation of the shockwave have an additional healing influence on the tissues around and the full part of the dorsal scan and the stem, the body here? Now, the vis viscosity of the contents do become more mobile. They, the viscosity decreases uh, temporarily after. You can see the insulation, the active pulse will actually reach the volar surface. So it's passing through lots of tissues. And so 
At right now, I cannot answer how there seems to be complete resolution with no adverse effects. So no recurrence in all successful cases, and that's better than average in a very small sample. So my current protocol with these over here, a small one with a definite stem into a joint space, I would treat it, I would recommend it. Gradually increase the power, depending on tolerance there. Continue to treat based on response to the first treatment. If it's not improving, stop treatment, refer on. Uh, make your reassessment relevant, whether it's a functional test, range of movement, or a manual muscle test. And if you are concerned, stop every few hundred pulses and check to see if you think you're on the right track. If you're not confident, stop, refer on. If it's a big ganglion, and this is a different case of mine, I'd say, look, my experience with those isn't as good. We've got the corticosteroid injection with aspiration, referral for surgery, watchful waiting. Refer on or leave it, discuss that with the patient. So this particular case here, I did treat three times with shockwave and it proved unsuccessful. I went in slowly. On palpation, the content, the contents were much more mobile for this treatment, but after three treatments, there was actually no change in size sonographically. The patient did want more treatment, but I discussed and said, look, I don't think it's worth continuing. In preparation for today, four months on, I emailed this patient and I asked him what he thought to the treatment. He confirmed the treatment actually did not help. And in fact, his condition had continued to deteriorate gradually and he was about to seek referral for further intervention. But just three weeks prior to that, he had a climbing fall. Um, like he is a real patient, so things do happen. He didn't land on his wrist, but he struck it on the way down. There was a massive increase in swelling for two weeks, following which his ganglion felt better than it's been for years. So, So you can see on reassessment there, the ganglion is still definitely there. It's much smaller, it's a third of the volume, third of the size, still not compressible. He may still require aspiration or surgery for that. And that depends on how it tolerates loading on returning to climbing there. So in summary, collateral ligaments, is this the best option? I'd say, look, it's a definite yes, that's my experience. Small to medium dorsal wrist ganglions is the best option. It's the best I have. Um, I don't think it's something that you would refer out for, but if it was in-house and convenient, it is a reasonable option. And it's one of these things, watch this space. If there's a proven low recurrence rate, it may go off the list for us all. Maybe there is a future or for focused shockwave in larger ganglions to decrease the viscosity of the fluid prior to um, aspiration. And in both of these cases, on the collateral ligament and the dorsal wrist ganglion, focused shockwave is much better tolerated than radial, which is why I have introduced them on this talk, with, which is titled Focused Shockwave. So I think it's do your research, other hand conditions where there is an evolving definite research base to support your treatment, include all of these. My advice is always ask yourself these questions. What am I trying to achieve? Is it safe? Is it the best thing I have to offer? Am I able to support it with research? So with, with this swift run through these two cases. Um, hopefully it's raised some questions or maybe just opinions uh, or comments. So I'll um, hand over to you, Dominic, to uh, moderate over Q&A. No, thank you very much, John. Very, uh, very insightful. I'm always amazed with rock climbing. I think it's, um, it's a very, it's an interesting sport. It always creeps out when people fall. Um, but yeah, I don't think you have to be mad to be doing it. Um, but yeah, so thank you very much for your presentation, John. Um, so as you mentioned, we're going to have a Q&A session. So if anybody has any questions, comments, opinions that they'd like to put forward,
The Q&A function is at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a mobile, it should be on the bottom of the screen as well. Submit your questions in there and we'll get them answered. Uh, but I think now's a good point to mention about the competition that we ran. Uh, we did have some um, entries and as you rightly mentioned, only one correct um, entry in which the winner of the Hawk Grip tool is, I mean, nice little drum roll, Gunnell Russell. So congratulations, Gunnell. Um, we will be in touch about your prize. Uh, well done for spotting it as a ganglion. Um, we're putting that suggestion forward anyway. Um, so yeah, yeah, so we'll be in touch. Um, so any questions and answers, please, please pop them in. Don't forget, you know, there's no such thing as a daft question. The, probably the one thing that you're thinking of is uh, probably what, you know, as cliched as it is, it's probably what everybody else is thinking. So please feel free to put them in. Uh, but just to kick us off, um, I, I think you kind of already kind of covered it with like, do your research. And I, I think this ganglion aspect and even the ligament um, injuries as well in shockwave will be turned to sort of off-label use and off-label being that there's very limited research available um, for us to to refer to. So, I mean, one is a good example of this. This is the case where clinical practice is actually ahead of research. And again, just to expand on those people who are looking, who have a shockwave system, who are looking to expand past tendinopathy and might be looking at ligaments, you know, what would you say to them, you know, who are looking to do that? I know, do your research is one of those aspects. So you're asking what, what do I think people should do is uh, just yeah. look at what you're trying to achieve. This, this is Carson Knobloch's book, um, and this is really insightful. I think one has to have a catalogue of, of favourite um, professors to chase down at um, conferences where you can ask them questions. Like I managed to um, have a private chat with Carson Knobloch at the, at the conference in 2018. Um, it's, it's really insightful to actually throw some opinions and, and get questioning on these, what you call off-label, but really one is trying to really just extrapolate on what Shockwave is useful for. Um, the British Shockwave Association conferences are great. Like, they, you know, you get to chat to people like Christoph Schmidt, who I collared for about 10 minutes. Ask questions. Um, like if I had Christoph Schmidt here today, like I'd say to him, look, what, he works in elite sport with uh, Bundesliga players. Um, and we're all in trained to think that working over lungs is a contraindication and it's, it should be unless you know better. But if there's anyone who would know whether they're treat, we're treating fractured ribs is okay, I think he would be the one or someone like him. So I think having a list of questions, um, really just trying to understand what, what you would do. If I did it today as well, I'll be asking him, well, we know that corticosteroid use is a contraindication. What about anabolic steroids? Like I've had a, I had an inter, uh, patient who won a couple of uh, British titles a couple of years ago having treatment. He was injecting anabolic steroids, which was okay in his sport. Now people who inject anabolic steroids, they're also taking various other substances that create some metabolic stress what is what seems to be safe and it's a discussion that i would find interesting to have so one's got to have their questions and, and search them out um, depends what what comes in through your door look at yeah. what your patient load is look at what you're not helping yeah no really interesting and you know in terms of those sort of other sort of off-label uses adam garnett has um who i know is a yet so um User, so you can focus shockwave out in Jersey. So Adam, welcome to the uh, welcome to session this evening. Um, he's interested to hear about the use of shockwave in decurvens and trigger finger. And do you have any experience in, in those applications? I think I'm the only physiotherapist in the um, in the country who's worked for more than thirty years and only seen one decurvens uh, patient in that time. Um, my sonography colleagues, one of them sees four of them a week. So um, the Quervens is mentioned in Carson Knobloch's book, much evidence to support it. Um, trigger finger, uh, yes, there, there is, there, there's a chapter on trigger finger in this book. Uh, and there's just a list of quite a bit of, um, quite a few research papers. Um, and again, that's not, I think I've seen two trigger fingers in 
uh, 30 years. So uh, maybe I can share some of those papers with you, Dominic, and you can um, distribute some information there. If that's of use. Yeah. It's a definite yeah. yes, according to Carson Knobloch's book. Absolutely. No, that's good. Um, and again, sort of on that um, sort of subject of the, I'll say off label, that's probably that this, this area is not more off label, it's around fractures. So sometimes around these injuries, you're going to see fractures. And I think you, you know, talked a, bit, a little bit about some of them as well. And there is lots of research around and, and supporting the use of shockwave for fractures. Do you, have you got any um, examples you can relate to here um, for, for fractures? Absolutely. Um, there's, there's much evidence for an osteogenic influence with focused shockwave. There's, there's no doubt about that. And uh, again, if you look at um, delayed union of scaphoid fractures, there's a lot of evidence of, of use of focused shockwave for that. But when it comes down to it, just because you can treat, the question I think is should you treat? So if someone's currently immobilized and they're being imagined is directed by a fracture clinic, I think. At the moment, the way things stand in the UK, if you're not there as a close associate or collaborating with hand surgery or fracture clinic, you do probably need to let nature take its course. Um, but once the patient is out of immobilization and able to take stress, uh, I think starting to look at what you for treatment is reasonable because uh, then you can talk about decreasing pain. Uh, initially, uh, this talk when I was chatting with uh, Katie, uh, we were, I was going to be delivering three or four cases, which we narrowed down to two, but there's a couple of cases that I left sneakily at the end of this presentation of fractures, which I might just flick to that to those, Dominic. It's, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's a, that's a scaphoid fracture. Now this lady, she, uh, that's radius, that's scaphoid, that's long axis, that's distal pole. There's actually a bit of cortical irregularity there, but if you, if, if, as, if we, as we go around the angles, you can imagine that's not fractured right through. Now this lady, she phoned me six weeks after a fall. She did not go to A and E. I said to her, look, go to A&E. That's what they have to do. She didn't go to A&E. She came to me about seven months post-injury. But I did tell her that she had to go get an X-ray, get it checked before coming in. So I don't think it's a good idea to be the primary therapist with these injuries, especially if there's been a fall. Um, and again, just because I, I could have treated her at two months, but I think it's a definite no. What, these need to be assessed by a fracture clinic. Ultrasound scanning, we do see a lot of surface detail, but we can't see through bone. So we are not the people to assess for those. And this is actually a really interesting case here. We did go to fracture clinic where I treated early. And if you look here on the ulnar styloid of the distal radio ulnar joint, that's compartment six, and that's the uh, radius there. And that irregularity in the ulnar styloid is quite distal. Um, as we go distal, as we go proximal, it's, there is actually no, no issue there. But he'd already been to fracture clinic. Fracture clinic had discharged him. So my thought, yes, that, that's okay to treat. And really what fracture clinic is saying is we do not need to immobilize the patient and we can get on and treat depending on clinical findings. He had one treatment of focused shockwave and his pain was much, much decreased. He's now had three treatments. Um, unfortunately, he's not happy, he's not resting it. So he may have to give him a good talking to He's a builder and he, his fist crashed through the wall whilst he's using his bolster chisel. Um, you know, and you know, smashing it in his hand just went through a wall, creating that environment. He, like he thought he was back to 100%, which is no way he was going to be. So he does need to still protect it. But a case like this, I see quite differently. He's been to fracture clinic. They've assessed and discharged that he doesn't need that type of immobilization. But one has to be careful. One needs to collaborate. 
if he had not improved, I would have sent a letter to him back to Fracture Clinic saying, look, I found that there's this irregularity. Can you please review your x-rays? But because it's improved, we don't need to, I don't think we need to go back down that avenue. And other cases, if there are uh, skate, if there are slips, trips, encourage them to go to Fracture Clinic or a &E first before coming to see you, is what I would say. Stay safe on the potential litigation, because I think we can <laughs> slip back into what might be someone else's uh, litigation. Yeah, no, perfect um, from that perspective. So um, we had a question come in from D Moore, who um, has asked, they've got a ETL system, I believe is, a, which is confirmed, it's a radial device. And she was yeah. wondering what frequency um, bar pulse that they should be using, or they could use, um, thing specifically for, oh, I think, yeah, for around the hand, like, you know, is there any anything around the hand that you could use radial yeah. shockwave? I know you mentioned, obviously, it's well, before, probably not very well tolerated. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I know the, I don't know the actual machine. I think with all machines, if you look at the variability of, the power outputs that I use are like focused. One has to go cut it. So there are some machines like you're using a, um, an EMS rate machine. They tend to become more comfortable as you go up the frequency range. Some other machines with different technology are more uncomfortable. So you've got to, they're a spectrum. So what you've got to do is think, okay, I'm going to aim for four or five out of 10 on a pain scale with this patient for his treatment. Start low, increase gradually, look at what frequencies are tolerated. Maybe try it on your own dorsal wrist and on your own finger and just see whether increasing the frequency makes it more comfortable or less comfortable. So the answer is I don't know. Uh, but as I said in the slide earlier, I was using radial shockwave on those climbers fingers earlier. Uh, Sorry, John, lost that bit. It's just dropped out. We we'll just wait a second. So don't let that stop you. Uh, Are we back? Hi, John, yeah, I think we're back. Yeah, they just dropped out a bit then, yeah. Okay, so I'm just saying that on the radial, I think you've just got to assess your machine. Try it on yourself before doing it on the patient. Start low frequency, like maybe five hertz, see what, how that's tolerated, compare that to your top frequency, which differs between machines, and see how you go there, then deliver what you think's right for the patient. Yeah. And just to expand on that, like, what's been your experience? Obviously, radial focus. We've had this discussion many times, and this discussion is not going to go away. But what's been your experience with using radial versus focused around hands, even feet, around those sort of more sensitive areas? Well, these uh, I use I use focused only. Um, I think in an area like uh, the, the hand, where there's a lot of bony prominences, uh, one it's very Focus shockwave is more specific in its uh, power delivery um, and it's better tolerated. Uh, so I, I think if you do plan to do lots of work on hands, I think there's a definite strength using a focus device, which you might not have if you're working on hips or, or other parts, but you, it's six and one half dozen of the other with some of them, but hands definite uh, focus is more tolerable. Cool, great. Thank you. Um, a question from Ian Gatt, who I know quite well. Ian, welcome. It's good to see you on this evening. Um, so he's asking, how do you actually know that in most of the cases you are seeing, you are actually healing the area and not just desensitizing the pain with shockwave? Okay. You, can, you can talk about that with any modality, whether you manipulate. Um, so it's, it's, like a, it's an endless question. Do functional tests, look at the um, infl inflammation. Um, you saw the uh, before and after shots of the um, of that finger, the swelling before and after, that's obvious healing. Um, so 
you just have to use your clinical nous, yeah. uh, not block yourself. And it's different. It's not, it's not like we're, we're using an anesthetic injection. Uh, we are trying to, you know, we are going for osteogenesis collagen generation, um, hopefully, in a lot of these cases. Uh, so you go, go to your functional test, go to your muscle test, which is why I'm going to my functional test on that thin deck, you know, where you start off 40% pinch grip to 80% pinch grip at the end of the treatment. So just, yeah, just have a good variety, make sure your, your objective testing represents what you think the patient is actually complaining of, is what I was yeah. saying. I mean, do you see any changes in the in your ultrasounds? Um, I mean, obviously we saw the ganglion, you know, that, that sort of fluid pocket did, did reduce, but with some of the other areas, like with ligament tendon, do you see any changes or, I mean, yeah, do you see any changes? How long do you see changes um, that can indicate to see healing? You're talking about sonogra sonographically. Um, from a sonographic perspective, like I think most of us sonographers, we're trained to expect no, to see no difference. Now, when it comes to if the joint is has a lax end feel, and then if the joint doesn't have a lax end feel, one would expect the sonographic dynamic test to look better. Um, and we do see that to a degree in small joints like fingers. In knees, no, we don't see that. Like if a knee feels as though it's tighter, they my experience is they still look lax on the sonographic retesting. Um, if there is if there is a muscle hematomas, you're going to see a massive change in, in the actual resorption uh, of the area. If there is um, an Achilles rupture, you're going to see fibrosis. You're going to see like a massive wedge of you know, scar tissue forming. Um, but once you see that, no matter how much you treat that massive wedge of scar tissue, that massive wedge which is there to stay, um, and that won't decrease if you're treating that. Calcifications, uh, they follow a variable path anyway, so if you're treating them whilst they're resolving, go through a resorption phase, it'll look like you've helped it resolve. But quite often, my experience with, say, calcific issues in the shoulder, calcific tendinopathies, the pain decreases, the um, calcification stays the same. So I think you've got to have a really good eye to see what level of maturity your um, calcification is at there. Cool. I hope that answers your, your question, Ian, um, on, 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 the, on that from a desensitization versus healing perspective. Um, John, in terms of like other things you can treat around the hand, uh, one of the questions I get actually quite a lot is um, post-surgical things. So where, you know, if, if somebody's had lig ligament repair, tendon repair, have you ever used shockwave to help with pain and healing post, yeah, post-repair or grafts and things like that? No, 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 no personal experience. And that's where I think if you are going to be dealing at that level, you have to be someone who's in play Professor Carson Knobloch's team. You have to be in an expert team and you've got to be collaborating. It's not something where you'll have surgery at the local hospital and then go to a private clinic. That's not directly associated with it. Um, yeah. I know that there are some mentions. Um, I, I don't get in that, involved with that at all. Um, what did the effort? <laughs> That's fair enough. And I mean, is there anything in the hand that you just absolutely just wouldn't treat, wouldn't go near? Um, I wouldn't treat. I wouldn't treat anything in the hand if the patient was pregnant. <laughs> so it's like, I, I see there's absolutely there's a little bit of uh, discussion on that on various forums. Should you treat? It's okay to treat the hand of pregnancy. To me, it's an absolute no no go area. So it's actually the, it's, it's more of a clinical. Uh, presentation of the whole patient there. Um, if the patient's on anticoagulants, I'd be really careful. I've had patients who have been on anticoagulants where um, they've been experiencing a level of heart failure, where they've had really poor skin condition on their legs, and they've had carpal tunnel syndrome. And they've said, look, I hear you can help with carpal tunnel. I'm thinking, no, not with this case. We may well have a metabolic stress, which I actually 
cannot sift out. You know, I, I don't understand. If there's rating, sometimes carpal tunnels can be uh, mimicking a sign of ice in the plexus. So it depends on the specificity of your diagnosis. So I'd be careful with that. So I, I wouldn't treat that. Uh, I wouldn't treat a, a tendon rupture. If the tendon was ruptured, I think you'd not um, treat that. Um, also, a pulley tear. Um, I, I see lots of pulley tears. I don't see that shockwave's got any use in the treatment of uh, actually sort of um, pulley tears. But tendon tears, probably. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. I think that's going to pretty much wrap up our question and answer session, John. Um, if anybody has got any more questions, they can submit them afterwards and we can get them answered. Um, but yeah, just to, to wrap everything up this evening, uh, thank you everybody for joining us and for your interaction. Um, it's been really good and I hope you've enjoyed the session and taken something out of it. John, thank you very much again for your time, your expertise and sharing your knowledge in this area and sharing your case studies as well. Um, I found it really valuable. I don't often see many hand patients, so I think it's been very good for me personally. Mm -hmm. um, so following this, we you'll receive a survey. So you'll get a, an email sent out that's going to have a survey. If you could please just take literally two minutes, just fill in a bit of feedback and any suggestions on things that you'd like to see in the future, pop them in there and we'll try and facilitate that. Um, John, if you could just flip to the next screen just for our upcoming webinars, that'd be fantastic, please. So we've got a couple of webinars coming up for you. So um, how can technology differentiate or elevate your private practice? This is with uh, Angela Botha of Physiolistic, who um, has made some pretty significant investment, Shockwave being one of them, Diagnostic Ultrasound being another, Tech Car Therapy being another, and it's just going to discuss how you can manage your clinic from a business perspective with technology. And then ask the expert around Shockwave with that Dr. Anders Brogard that we've done some sessions with before as well. So again, if you're interested in Shockwave and want to pick an expert's brain, um, then again, you can. that's a session that you can join for anybody, again, who's watching the recording, if you do have any questions, then please submit them to info at physiquip.com. Otherwise, we'll wrap that up there for tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, John. Everybody stay safe and well and have a good evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>